When primary aralamines or anilines with an aromatic group, a benzene ring linked to NH2, react with nitrous acid, we get these diazonium salts. And these diazonium salts are fantastic electrophiles at the carbon linked to the N2 plus group, because this, as we'll see shortly, is a good leaving group. So we can add a wide variety of nucleophiles to this carbon and displace N2 in a nucleophilic aromatic substitution reaction involving these diazonium salts. And the beauty of it is we know how to install the NH2 group on an aromatic ring in a controlled manner via nitration followed by reduction with something like 10 and hydrochloric acid. So what this enables is nucleophilic aromatic substitution in a very controlled way without a need to install tons of electron withdrawing groups or go through a benzyne or arine intermediate. Diazonium salts open the door to a lot of synthetic possibilities via nucleophilic substitution involving aromatic rings. So it's a relatively old reaction type, but highly useful and going to expand our synthetic toolbox dramatically. So Again, just to reiterate this, because dinitrogen, N2, is a fantastic leaving group, aryl diazoniums can participate in nucleophilic substitution reactions. This N2 plus is an awesome leaving group because once it departs with a pair of electrons, well, that forms N2, which is a gas which can bubble out of the reaction mixture, right? And in the presence of a nucleophile, here I've just kind of represented that in general as nu minus. Nu minus can add in here, and after, for example, formation of uh, reactive intermediate beta elimination kicks off N2, something along these lines is how we can think about this. We end up with a new substituted benzene ring as the product. Now, the specific conditions used here can be a little bit esoteric. In many cases, we can't just treat with any old nucleophile, but in some cases we can, as we'll see on the next slide. But an important general class of uh, nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions involving diazoniums uses a rather esoteric set of reagents known as uh, Sandmeyer reagents, copper one salts, and these are called Sandmeyer reactions. So we use as our nucleophile a copper one salt of the nucleophile, and the group we install is either a halogen or a cyano group. So for example, if we use copper one bromide, Br minus displaces N2, and we end up with bromobenzene. If we use copper one chloride, we get chlorobenzene. If we use copper one iodide, we get iodobenzene. And if we use copper cyanide, we get cyanobenzene. And this last one is particularly notable because it's hard to imagine how we would install a cyano group any other way, right? Um, we could do it maybe by installing a carboxylic acid and then converting to an amide and then dehydrating the amide. But this is a single step direct route to cyanobenzene from the diazonium, which again, we know how to make via nitration, followed by reduction to an NH2 group and diazotization using, for example, sodium nitrite and hydrochloric acid. So this is a nice route to cyanobenzenes that we wouldn't have um, without the Sandmeyer methodology. This slide shows three more examples of nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions of aryl diazoniums. In the first case, we have fluoroboric acid as a source of fluoride. Copper 1 fluoride doesn't really work in the Sandmeyer reaction, so instead we make use of HBF4. HBF4 is sort of like H plus and BF4 minus, and the BF4 minus anion is a source of nucleophilic fluoride. Just like NaBH4 is a source of nucleophilic hydrogen, hydride, right here, BF4 minus supplies fluoride, and the fluoride displaces N2 and we get fluorobenzene. And by the way, just to back up a second, under each uh, reaction arrow, I've noted that to form the diazonium, we lose a molecule of water as well as one equivalent of NaCl, Na plus, and Cl minus when HCl is used as the acid. If you form a diazonium salt in aqueous solution, which is very, very common, right, since we're using, for example, aqueous hydrochloric acid, and then you simply warm it up a little bit, and, and here, don't let the heat um, misguide you here, this is something like 20 or 25 or maybe 30 degrees Celsius, water is nucleophilic enough to displace N2+, and you'll start seeing little bubbles of nitrogen gas forming in your aqueous solution of the diazonium salt, and this produces a phenol, um, just via nucleophilic substitution by water. 
there. And this happens again if you take that cold solution of the diazonium salt, for example, that we prepared here, and just warm it up to room temperature, it will slowly but surely lose N2 with OH coming in to produce a phenol. So this is a nice way to link oxygen to an aromatic ring. And again, very difficult to imagine how to do this in a, in a way that is this direct using the reactions we already know, right? This is a very straightforward nucleophilic substitution, very mild nucleophilic substitution of OH for N2. And we would have to use very, very harsh conditions using, for example, sodium hydroxide at very high temperature with a very electron deficient aromatic ring to establish the CO bond via the nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions we already know. And this last one's a little funky. Uh, it involves the use of H3PO2 as a reducing agent. And the idea here is we can actually erase the diazonium group from existence using a source of nucleophilic hydrogen or hydride. And the reagent of choice here is H3PO2. And I did want to look a little bit at this reagent just to get under the hood of how this reaction works a little bit to help you remember why we use H3PO2 and why it's a reducing agent. One thing to note about H3PO2 is that it's a lot like H3PO4, at least in chemical formula, but it's missing two oxygens. And so on some level, we can think of it as a reduced form of phosphoric acid, right? It's a, it's a phosphorus oxyacid with not as many oxygens as phosphoric acid. So it's a reduced version of phosphoric acid. This makes it a reducing agent, right? It's got sort of an excess of electrons in a sense. Um, it could be oxidized is one way you could think about this. And if you look at the Lewis structure, this structure has a couple of pH bonds, and we can think of that pH bond as a nucleophilic source of hydrogen. And that adds in at the electrophilic carbon, displaces the N2 plus group, and we end up simply back at benzene. Now you may wonder, okay, if we started at benzene, right, if I did the whole nitrate and then reduce to get to aniline, and then I made the diazonium, and then I did this, what was the point of doing this, <laughs> right? Well, keep in mind, you can do things with the aniline, right? We could do, we could isolate that and do electrophilic aromatic substitution, and then remove the nitrogen sort of directing group via this reduction approach. If our final target didn't contain a nitrogen group linked to the aromatic ring, but we needed groups, for example, in the ortho and para positions, well, we could achieve that by using this sort of temporary directing group strategy. Install the nitrogen, do some EAS, and then do the diazotization and ultimately substitute H minus quote for N2 plus to get back to no nitrogen substituent in the final target. Reactions of aryl diazoniums enable us to create new substitution patterns in substituted benzenes that we wouldn't be able to access using methods that we've seen previously. And this example really emphasizes this, where the target is 1,3,5-tribromobenzene with three bromines in a meta relationship. Now the bromines, as halogen atoms, are ortho-para directors, so some kind of forcing bromination approach where we just try to shove three bromines on the aromatic ring, even if we could get all three bromines linked using something like aluminum trichloride and Br2, they'd appear in a 1,2 or a 1,4 or 1,2,4 relationship, not this 1,3,5 substitution pattern that we want. However, one thing we can notice is that the bromines are all either ortho or para to this hydrogen I've circled. For example, this bromine and this bromine are both ortho to this H, and this bromine is para to this H. So if we could work backwards to a compound in which this H was an electron donating group, then it is feasible to install the bromines at these positions relative to this position bearing the H. Now, how do we even think about that? Well, diazonium methodology enables that we, because we can work backwards to a compound containing NH2 where that H is located. And ultimately, we can erase that NH2, quote unquote, converting it to an H using reduction of an aryl diazonium intermediate. And so this, to get to the tribromo uh, aniline here, well, we can think about just brominating aniline right? And we can work aniline back to benzene by thinking about a reduction transform in reverse, right? Reducing the nitrobenzene to NH2 and then simply nitrating 
benzene. But the key part of this synthesis really is this idea of working backwards from an unsubstituted position to an aniline via an aryl diazonium. So let's see how this looks in the forward direction now. First, we start with an electrophilic nitration. Nitric acid and sulfuric acid converts benzene to nitrobenzene. We can reduce the nitrobenzene to aniline using something like 10 and hydrochloric acid, followed by a workup with sodium hydroxide, aqueous sodium hydroxide, to deprotonate the intermediate anilinium salt there, right? The uh, uh, hydrochloric acid is going to protonate that nitrogen. We need the base to remove that proton. To brominate, well, because aniline is so darn reactive in electrophilic aromatic substitutions, it's such a great nucleophile, we don't even need a catalyst. We can just treat with at least three equivalents of Br2, and three bromines will be installed at the ortho and para positions relative to the NH2 group, and we've accessed this product here. And now the question is, how in the world do we convert this substituted aniline into this sort of less substituted 135-tribromo product. Well, we can do it through the intermediacy of an aryl diazonium and making use of H3PO2. So we can, for example, treat with sodium nitrite and aqueous hydrochloric acid to make the diazonium chloride and then to convert the N2 plus group into H. Well, we saw how to do that at the bottom of the previous slide using h 3 PO2. So the use of H3PO2 here sort of erases the nitrogen group from existence and leaves us with an H and we've accessed our final target. So the key here to this whole approach was this idea that we can turn an NH2 into an H via an aryl diazonium and we can use that NH2 as a directing group and there are various other possibilities on this theme, right? We could isolate the nitrogen and do friedel crafts isolation, something like that to install a carbonyl group somewhere else on the ring and in essence erase that nitrogen group using reduction of an aryl diazonium. So far we focused on the carbon in the aromatic ring of an aryl diazonium that's linked to the N2 plus group as an electrophile. But if we unpack the structure of the diazonium group a little bit more, we may also recognize that this nitrogen that's linked to the positively charged nitrogen, the sort of hanging or terminal nitrogen is also a good electrophile. There's an alternative resonance form of the diazonium group where we push electrons toward that positively charged nitrogen and end up with a positive charge on the hanging nitrogen, quote unquote, that shows that it is electrophilic. And there are reactions that take advantage of this electrophilic reactivity of the nitrogen within the N2 plus group as well. They're known as azo coupling reactions. In an azo coupling reaction, an aryl diazonium serves as the electrophile not at carbon, but at nitrogen. And we treat with an electron rich aromatic ring as the other reaction partner, and that serves as a nucleophile. So from, from the perspective of that electron-rich benzene, which in this reaction scheme is this reactant, it's an electrophilic aromatic substitution. But the group that's coming in is this entire group containing the NN double bond linkage. That's known as an azo group, which is why this is called an azo coupling. The product is often known as an azo dye, as these products are highly conjugated highly colored, and this is one of these reactions that you'll often see in teaching organic chemistry laboratories just because of the beautiful colors and the things you can do with azo dyes. These have important historical, practical, and industrial importance as actual dye molecules in practice, dye compounds. So a typical example of an azo coupling is shown sort of in the top middle of this slide. We start with an aniline, and this may be substituted to start here. I've just started with aniline, and we produce the diazonium salt in the usual way using sodium nitrite and hydrochloric acid. And then we recognize, okay, that nitrogen that's hanging off is an electrophile for all the reasons we just discussed. And so we can think about this as acting as an electrophile in an EAS reaction with an electron-rich benzene. So now we treat with a different aromatic compound that is electron-rich, contains an electron donating group linked to the benzene ring. And what we observe is nucleophilic addition to the sort of hanging nitrogen of the diazonium group, followed by loss of a proton. <clears throat> and this produces a product in which the azo group here has added to the para position with respect to the donating group. So notice, this is just the donating group acting as an ortho para director. This tends to give high percentage of the para product because of the bulkiness 
of the azo group, right? And we've made a new bond at the para carbon relative to the donating group. So from the perspective of this molecule here, this is an EAS reaction. We can think about it as a kind of nucleophilic addition from the aryl diazonium's perspective. So let's see how we can apply this reaction in synthesis. Well, now that we recognize this reaction, we can recognize this C-in linkage as a bond we can think about disconnecting in the reverse direction when we do retrosynthesis, right? We can think about making that bond through an azo coupling. And so sort of sending the electrons back to the, well, electron-rich aromatic side, I should say, gets us back to this electron-rich benzene. And it's actually important to pause here and note the mistake that we just made in, in thinking about breaking this bond. This is an electron deficient aromatic ring. That should be on the diazonium side, the electrophile side. We want our nucleophile to be electron rich, right? And so it makes more sense to think about disconnecting this bond, producing an electron rich benzene and a diazonium in which we have an electron withdrawn group the sulfonic acid group, right? So we can imagine combining anisole, this electron-rich benzene, with this diazonium intermediate, and that would produce, after loss of a proton, this azo-coupled product. And to make the diazonium, well, we just work backwards to the aniline, right? We can imagine treating this aniline with the sulfonic acid and the methyl in the right positions with sodium nitrite and hydrochloric acid to get this diazonium. So that's done first, and we add in the aromatic ring and then the reaction solution turns colors, things get exciting, and the product we get is this azo dye. 